Hello everyone, I'm David Butler. I'm Emily Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This. We are so excited to be all together. I hope you like that drawing on the board. It's extra special. There's <laughs> shapes <laughs> this week on the board for your viewing pleasure if you're just on the podcast. Let's see on a podcast is a drawing of the tabernacle because we're kind of getting into that today. If you're new with us, we move through this year the Old Testament section by section following the Come Follow Me schedule and uh, just exploring things we think you don't want to miss as we go through. This is such a good one today. Do we want to do the timeline yeah, first? let's do that first because it's going to trick you. This is a little you. confusing. It's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> sounded like it was going to be a roller coaster. And really, it's just Keep a sticker. Your hands and arms inside the vehicle. Oh, I, I thought that was the plane words for a second. Okay. <laughs> So we have a picture. Remember when we put the 12 sons of Israel up on here, they were all kind of surrounding. We'll talk about this when we get into the book of Numbers, why they're set up the way that they are. We just wanted you to in get introduced to the boys so you knew the house of Israel. Um, we're right here, right after the golden calf incident, but piece number 19 is actually the tabernacle itself. And so we're going to put that over here. And talk about that today. So it just goes in the middle of your of the camp of Israel. And we're gonna learn about why it's right here in numbers. Yeah, but when today we get you there. just care about all the pieces on the inside. So last week, um, if you were with us last week, we kind of um, we looked at this idea. Well, remember Moses was um, the children of Israel were entering into a covenant relationship with God. He'd made a promise with Abraham that um, he was going to take the blessings and his presence um, into all nations and into all places in the whole world. And he was going to use the family of Abraham to do that. And so when he pulls them out of Egypt, he takes them to Mount Sinai to let them officially enter into this unique relationship with him where he would help them to become a kingdom of priests, a holy people. And so remember, they enter into that, and then Moses goes up and receives more information. And while he's up there for 40 days, he gets the blueprints, a very, very detailed hmm. blueprints. And there's a reason for that we'll talk about in just a second, for this tabernacle, that God wants to dwell among his people. He wants to bring his presence, right? That blessing that Adam and Eve enjoyed in the Garden of Eden, the presence of God, we're restoring that gift, that, that blessing among them. Um, anyways, remember he comes down and while he's walking down, there's the golden calf incident that's happening and he breaks all the commandments at once. And then, um, you know, just kind of everybody just... It wasn't even funny. This it was so <laughs> it was just, it's good. It's good stuff. It's biblical humor. Um, uh, then he goes back up to the Lord and they reconcile that relationship and the Lord shows that he's gracious and he's merciful. And, and so Moses is going to come back down with a set of new tablets. And um, we looked last time in the JST that the thing that was missing from that new set of tablets was just the highest and holiest order of the temple right? The ordinances of the highest and holiest order, but everything else he keeps with them. And then he's going to add on to it. So this is something that we call the law of Moses. It's something that a phrase that we're familiar with. And what it is, is everything that he revealed on Sinai minus that highest and holiest order that he removes from them. And then now he's going to give them additional things. And we'll get that into that in just a second. But the end of Exodus is them now implementing that blueprint that he received up on Mount Sinai of building now the actual tabernacle. And I love thinking about this part because let's just remember they're in the wilderness. Like they came out, you're like, yes. They came no. <laughs> out of Egypt with whatever they could carry the night they left in haste. Remember, they left in haste. Uh, they went and borrowed things from all their neighbors they were going to take with them. And everyone was like, yeah, get out, get out. And they took all the stuff. And now they're in the wilderness. And there's no like Walmart or Hobby Lobby or Joanne's fabric store or Home anything Depot. like that. They're <laughs> also Home Depot. I'm thinking about the fun stuff. 
Like the gold and the fabric and like the ribbons. how you were going to make it out of craft glue. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> the whole thing. I was thinking of the pretty parts. So I'm in charge of the fabric. Okay. You be in charge I'll of I'll build the actual, like, the most important parts. Okay. Ark of the Covenant and things like this. Okay. <laughs> and I'll cover up. <laughs> okay, good. Inside and outside with gold. Um, so the, the thing that I love to think about every time I get to this part is, can beauty be found in wilderness places? Like... How are they going to build this beautiful tabernacle for God? And what it's going to come out of really is what they have. Yeah, It's going to come from what they have to offer. That's what is going to grow up this um, temple in the midst of a wilderness. And I love the thought of thinking about the people at the very beginning and what will they bring to the work. And it's cool that they've, um, they are prepared for this already, right? That they might initially hear the instructions and be like, we don't have that. He's yeah. like, oh, actually, I readied you this already. And if you pull everybody together with what each of you have, then you're going to be able to do happen. it. And that is my favorite part of this because it starts out in 36 verse 1. And he's talking about these two men. And he says, these two plus every wise-hearted men in whom the Lord put wisdom an understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary. That like he had already pulled together every one they needed with all the talents they needed to be able to build this thing in the middle of the wilderness. And it, it just makes me think about like even our time now that what has God put in you and what has he put in me and what has he put in each of us that is going to allow us to build the kingdom, to, to build beauty in the midst of wilderness places. And I can remember reading this chapter one time, many, many years ago, and I was so intrigued by this process of them bringing together all this beauty in the wilderness. And kind of, he goes through and he talks about each of the people, what they did, what they were like, what they were going to bring to the work. And when you look like in Verse 35, it talks about, Take you from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. And in verse 10 of chapter 35, he says, Every wise-hearted among you shall come, and you're going to make everything the Lord hath commanded. And in verse 21, And they came everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. And in verse 22, they came both men and women, as many as were willing hearted. And and then they start bringing all of this stuff that is just whatever the thing was that they had. And I love that all the women um, were able to spin with their hands and bring that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and fine linen linen and um, (laughs) and goat's hair and and all of these things. And, And they brought all of this stuff that they had with them. And I love that it talks about every wise hearted man in 36 verse two, in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even everyone whose heart stirred him up to come up to the work and to do it. And I can remember reading this chapter and thinking to myself, what does it mean to be wise hearted? Like, aren't you so intrigued by, like, I want to be a wise hearted woman. I want God to give me that title, but what does it look like? And I can remember several years ago when I was reading this, just, I just prayed in the morning to help me know where to look to find out what it means to be wise hearted. That's what I want to know. And then I just kind of went along with my day, which is the habit of how I read scriptures. I'll read a couple verses like these ones that had stood out to me. And then I'll just ponder on them as I do my laundry Mm. or do my dishes or whatever. Just what does it mean to be wise hearted? Well, Then as the day went on, I got busier and busier and totally forgot about it. And I had a party I was going to that night and we got there and it was just all these uh, women who had gathered together and we were having dinner and the person in charge of the party had put words on all of our plates that were like love and my word was prosperity. That was the word that I had gotten, but everybody had like a different word. And while we were eating, you went around and talked about the word that you had been given. Mm. And you could just teach anything you wanted about the word that you had been given or give a definition of it or talk about why it was important in our life. And This is amazing. 
that we had that dinner. Yeah, like it was I, awesome. Like I just go to In and Out with my <laughs> friends. Okay, well, <laughs> so we had this, this fun dinner. Just... <laughs> my word was prosperity. So when I got to it, you started with your definition, and this was my definition of prosperity. See if this is true. It's when you go to the grocery store and you can buy whatever butter you want without looking at the price. I just thought that last week. That is prosperity. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that's true? It's like just being able to go and not like on your calculator, if I buy this and then I buy this, am I going to meet my grocery budget at the end? It would just be like, just go buy whatever butter you want. I In just, my mind, that would that. be <laughs> prosperity. I just love that you picked butter. Is there a wide like range of price in butter? Yes. Do you not know that about no, butter? No, no. I just yeah, like I think I would... really nice butter is expensive. Oh. Next time you go to the grocery store, look at the butter. Okay. I Cheese would've... is the same way. I would have thought <laughs> cars. You can just buy whatever car Listen, you want, but that's nice. That's was... like a lot of oh. prosperity. <laughs> I'm just talking about normal people prosperity right now. So we're getting a little sidetracked, but still fun. Yeah. Um, so... Anyways, we laughed, everybody laughed, and we just talked about like, you, were you ever gonna be like confident in your finances? Because we were young and that's what it felt like you may never be. And then I came home and went to bed. And the next morning I woke up and my favorite breakfast at the time was toast with butter on it. That was my favorite. So when I got in, I was out of butter. And so I wrote butter on my grocery list that was on the fridge and then went, went back to getting my house ready and it's early it's like 7 30 in the morning hmm. and a knock comes on my door and i open the door and it's one of the ladies from the dinner the hmm. night before and she's holding the most expensive butter you can buy oh. at the grocery store <laughs> so and it's wrapped in tool <laughs> and she says to me i don't know why but the lord woke me up at the at four in the morning this morning and told me to go get you this and to bring it to you and to tell you he wants you to have prosperity. Oh. And then she left. And then this is what I did. I died. I shut the door. I was so embarrassed. I was like, why did that just happen? Why did the Lord wake her up at four in the morning to tell me, to tell her I needed butter? Mm. I can buy my own butter. I didn't need her mm. to buy the butter for me. And, and plus it was butter. Like it wasn't like it was this amazing <laughs> thing or it was like a life-threatening situation. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm sitting there thinking about it at the kitchen counter with my now butter wrapped in tool, all of a sudden the spirit says to me, it's not about the butter. Hmm. And I was like, well, what is it about? And then I was like, what have I been praying about that Jannie would show up at my door at 7.30 in the morning with like she had to go buy that in the sixes, you know, yeah, to get yeah. to me. And it was the most important thing she had to do that day was drop off butter to my house hmm. first thing in the morning. And um, so then I thought, well, what have I been praying about? And immediately I remembered, oh, I wanted to know what it looked like to be wise hearted. Hmm. Someone whose spirit stirred him up to the Lord's work to bring the Lord's offering. And all of a sudden, the Lord had showed me, right? On that morning, someone wise-hearted went over to Smith, bought butter, wrapped it up in tool, and brought it to my door in order for the Lord to teach me. And sometimes it's about bringing butter, right? Probably not very often, but sometimes it's about calling someone at just the exact right time or showing up or, um, you know, coming into those moments. I remember a conversation I had with my friend recently and she was like i just feel like i'm not being utilized right now i i'm wondering what i have to give and what could i bring to the work and i love what happens in exodus 35 and 36 is it's almost as if the lord is giving us permission to just sit for a minute and say what have i put in you what hmm. have i put in you and how could you bring that you know, what I've put in you to the work. How could you bring that to the table right now? And I love that that is how the tabernacle begins is um, willing would mean generous and that it's a voluntary and that you're liberal with whatever you have to bring. And you think about when you think about having a, a willing heart or a wise heart, that's something that cares or is courage minded or 
you know, you would think about that. And to be stirred up might mean to lift or arise or bring or carry or desire or give or help. And I just love this thought of this people who the Lord was raising up, who he was growing up. We're going to be these wise and willing hearted people who weren't just going to build a place that would become the tabernacle, but would actually become the Lord in their midst. Mm. And maybe that's the people we need to become for the Lord to be in our midst. Well, and that's what's neat about it is when, when the whole picture is finished, right? You just like you kind of needed every part of that tabernacle to give you the complete picture of not only God's presence, but of what he was trying to do among them. And it's just neat that it was the combination of everybody bringing what they had, what the Lord yeah. had put in them. It, the whole thing was a gift from him, right? From start to finish. But they got a chance to like reciprocate the giving. And I, I don't know, I think maybe this is a like a lesson on the beauty and value of a faith community, mm. that it's within a faith community together that we experience the presence of the Lord. We don't experience the full measure yeah, of his presence so without each All other. Yeah. yeah. And without the willingness to give and be generous among each other with, with yeah. what we have. That's so it good. It takes butter to experience <laughs> oh. the full goodness of God, <laughs> oh God. you know? So this is what the, he calls the people together, actually assemble. And if you're reading straight through the book of Exodus, you'll see a lot of repeats from that verse chapters 25 through 32. And then here, because the first thing time was the blueprint and the plan. And then now this is the actual implementation of it. And, I and they're putting it too. up. Yeah. I forgot about this part that is so good. Um, then they spake unto Moses saying, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work. This is oh, in 36 awesome. verse five. Um, <clears throat> for the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it and too much. Mm. Don't you just love that thought of like abundance in the community when everybody is just bringing what the Lord has put on their heart to share with the community? Yeah, and I just, I wanna think that they would have looked at their surroundings and the desertness and the and the state of their lives and thought scarcity. Yes. You know, because they're like, we're in a desert. Like, all right, get yeah. some sticks and a cactus and whatever. But it, but that's so interesting that the Lord taught them that Yeah, they didn't giving, just have enough. Yeah, by giving, they experienced abundance. Yes. You know, which seems, yes. Opposite, and we have a phrase that we both love. That we've, you know, if you've been with us for a while, that um, that chapters like this make you think of. And when they built the Nauvoo Temple last year, and it's that whole concept of bringing your finest. Oh, I was like, no, the Nauvoo Temple has been built for like years. <laughs> I meant when we studied it last year. Okay. You know that it just like that they brought. What was that line? Yeah, that they their brought, finest. Their, they brought the, more than enough for yeah, the service of the work. You know, and to me, I'm just like, oh, that was just reflective of the feelings they had for he who was asking. That they're like, I'm going to bring more than I actually have to bring. Yeah. Because or I, am. Yeah. Yeah. Or have. Yeah. And to that thought of bringing their finest, just whatever is the best I can bring into this situation I, lots of times i think to myself i just i hope at the end of my life what people think about me is that every situation i entered my first question was how can i help mm. how can i help in this situation and don't you feel like that's how they were in that moment that they just were like okay how, how could i help let me go back and see what i have and bring it to the work and what if we all entered god's work with that perspective of just how can I help and just the celebration of like yes. creating all of this initially right to watch the pieces of the tabernacle come to life to sew the the curtains and, yes. all, and all their beauty and the detail on them and the gold and the bronze and the brass you know things that they're creating just yeah. just that synergy that was happening there and then to get to chapter 40 when they actually like when they actually put it all together, the tabernacle, and they put it together in an order that's even in instructive. Um, but they put this all together and then you get that scene we should pause at in 40 for just a second when we heard the plan for this and then in verse 12, and they bring Aaron and his sons mm. unto the door of the tabernacle of congregation and they washed them with water 
and they put upon Aaron the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him that he could minister in the priest's office. And just that, that now they get to experience like just these ordinances of washing and anointing and and being clothed in, yeah. in holiness and put up the the whole tent. And then you get to verse 34 and it says... Oh, wait, before you get there. Before you get there, you have to do the funnest oh, part. I know what you're going to do. Yeah, 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 because this is so fun. One of my favorite things to do when I teach verse 40 is to look for the most repeated phrase in verse 30. In, in <laughs> chapter 40. And as you go through um, all of all of these things, you're going to start seeing this phrase over and over again. It says, thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. And you're going to see that in 16 and 19 and again in 21 and 23 and 25. At, like it just keeps coming. In my scriptures, um, I marked it up like this if you can see can you see the lines right there and they all lead to that circle right here and i love that it was the combination of all of those and and as the lord commanded moses so did he that leads to what happens in verse 34 because verse 34 starts with then then. yeah so Mm -hmm. then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the lord filled the tabernacle and just to imagine what that experience would have been like. And it's neat that it began with just where it all, like where, just to culminate in this, yeah. you know, it feels like Pentecostal almost. It feels like Kirtland Temple-esque. Yes. It feels like a rushing of, and now his presence is among them. And that word is so instructive right then, you know, as, as they listened to what he asked, it all had a purpose. It all had an end in mind, and that was so that him, him he in could their be midst. among them, yeah. right? I mean, he used to be on top of the mountain, you know, and now he's actually in their in their presence. Yeah, I love that. Um, and we have this picture of the tabernacle on the on the side. And if you're doing the tip-ins, this is where you're going to want to put um, this tip-in picture is going to go right here, just so every time you turn to Exodus. 40, you'll remember, oh yeah, this is how the tabernacle looked. And it'll be the same picture on our um, Old Testament timeline. If you kind of want to look at, okay, what are all these pieces? Or you've got it in the journal Yeah, you'll be able to look at. Um, do you want to read that thing from Alfred about, one thing that you want to think about as you study, um, both the actual, like first the actually the building of it and the materials of it and the setting up of the tabernacle. In a second, we'll talk about the functions of the tabernacle, but all of it was very, very particular. There are five full chapters of very detailed instructions on how big, what color, what to do for every single piece of it. And that's a lot of, that's a lot of writing. That's a lot of speaking without having a a great purpose. And, And this is such a and I, one of my favorite ways to actually study these chapters in the Old Testament is to start looking up. Um, if you will look up what the uh, symbolism is for like bronze and brass and gold and blue and scarlet and like start writing down what all of those colors were. And then shapes and, and numbers yep, and like all squares. Of those things. And... and just Google the Hebrew meaning of each of those things because all of a sudden a million things start coming into focus. For example, um, we'll learn that blue was the color that represented heaven and red was a color that represents earth and purple would be like both of those two things meeting together in one place. Or as you think about gold, which is going to represent holiness, and it's so awesome when you read that gold would be on the outside and on the inside of the ark and would then all of a sudden start symbolizing, oh, my inward and my outward appearance both needs to be holy. And you start looking at all of this symbolism that is taking place throughout every single part of what is put within. And even just the idea that you'll notice that the metals start to become more precious the closer you get into the to the presence of God in it. And then you And start some to, of them mean judgment and some things mean mercy and you just all of this character and attribute of God is manifest 
everywhere that you look, wherever you look. And then maybe we should even say too, and then what the function of, how was an altar of sacrifice used and what does that teach? And what is a laver of water? And what does that teach? And why veils, right? Yeah. And why like three sections? And why a lampstand? What, what light and why incense that's continually burning and why bread, you know, on the table yeah. consistently. And, and some of those things you'll find in scripture and some of those things you'll find through studying. And some of those things will come as the spirit just tutors you as you are reading through um, these verses in these chapters. We love what Alfred Adersheim says. He says, we repeat everything here had a spiritual meaning. The material of which the ark, the dresses of the priesthood, and all else was made. The colors, the measurements, the numbers, the vessels, the dresses, the services, the priesthood itself, and all proclaimed the same spiritual truth and pointed forward to the same spiritual reality, which was Christ in the midst of his church. And I just love as you um, study, you're going to be able to find things that will help you picture what all of these things look like as you think about the clothing and you're going to study um, the garment and the undergarment and the um, we love the bells and the pomegranates on the bottom of the clothing that they would wear or even as you get into thinking about yeah what were you going to well say? just about like the bells and the pomegranates like it's neat to think about uh, the high priest had on this um, vestment that had bell, pomegranate, bell, pomegranate all along yes. the bottom of his uh, of the robes. And so as he would walk, there would just be a, a ringing of the bells. And so if you think about where that tabernacle is in the midst of where everybody's going to be camped, like from the early morning to the end of the day, they would hear... Yes. The ringing of the bell as like a constant like reminder, reminder that he was among them. Yep. And you'll love the um, pictures of the tabernacle too as you look in and look, look at what the light would have been and look at what the shoe bread table would have looked like and, and where the Ark of the Covenant would have been and all of those things. It's just, it's so aw awesome to visually experience what that would have looked like. And then where we see similarities today in the way we worship and our ordinances and how we enter into covenant relationship that you love that everything is so symbolic and it would be fun for just a minute to talk about. Hey, everybody. A field trip. Yeah, here we are. Just a surprise one. Listen, we weren't planning on this. So we filmed our video talking about the symbolism of the temple already in the basement. Then we found out through a series of serendipitous <laughs> events that this tabernacle or a replica of the tabernacle was commissioned by the Huntington Beach Stake or a stake in California a couple of years ago for a youth conference, I think. Anyways, and it's now set up here in, in Bountiful. And so we drove up here and we were just wanted to kind of show you so you could get an idea of it and talk about some of the symbolism as we move through it. So I didn't even know. I, listen, I've been wearing a hat and here we are I just know, in the most <laughs> random. Like, this is so random. But, but this is so fun. And you want to start out with this outside part right here. Um, and we love what we just learned from our friend Donald Perry, that there were two reasons for this outer gate or fence or what do you want to what do you want to call the outside yeah, just structure the, the the yeah the fence or something yeah. yeah what was it and you had this first veil that you would walk through or this gate that you would walk through oh, but and you didn't talk, talk about, about the, the you didn't talk first. about the two things, we say yeah. The two things yeah yeah because yeah, i thought it was interesting that it was both the, remember we've talked about this idea of setting bounds and like setting aside thresholds for sacred places and it was seven and a half feet tall so that there was like a restriction of sight for the sacred things that would happen inside and also a, a bound for entry into it also. And which had to do with um, level of worthy, worthiness for being able to go within these temple walls. So we love that even clear back then, there were these bounds set of how you would get in. And then this first gate that is right here, you're going to see that red and the purple and the blue all coming together. And let's just, in case we cut that part out. So the red would represent earth and also blood. Um, the blue would represent 
heaven. Yeah. And the purple is going to represent royalty. And and we love that it's kind of a coming together, that blue and that red coming together. And everything that you see in here wants to be symbolic of Jesus. So you want to be thinking about that. And remember, um, he says, right, I, stand I'm, at the gate. I stand at the gate. I am the gate. I am. I, I am the way. And he is where heaven and earth meet. He is the royal one. He is, is the priest, you know? And so there's just every single part of this is so going to teach a message of him. Yeah. So we'll take okay, you inside. Let's go inside. Okay. We're going to walk in together, but we first just wanted to show you this outside. So, um, I don't know if we said this, but the actual, this was built to the actual dimensions of that ancient tabernacle. And one thing is we kind of walk in that, um, that we learned today that was just really neat is the ancient Israelites, as they would travel from other cities to come to where the tabernacle or temple was, the moment they saw it, they would begin to sing these hymns. They were known as the hymns of ascension. And it was just a practice that right when they saw it, they would begin to prepare their hearts and their minds for the worship that was going to take place. So this is the inside courtyard. And again, it's just built to those same, um, Dimensions. Yes, yes dimensions. dimensions of it. Okay, this is the altar of sacrifice. There's the gate that we just walked through, and you can see the tabernacle behind us. But the first thing that you would come to is this altar of, of sacrifice. And this is where all the sacrifices of the temple took place. So you would have come in, you would have brought your lamb without blemish. It would have been checked by the priests who were yeah. here that would look over and make sure that was going to work for the sacrifice. Probably in one of the corners is where the animal would have been killed. And then you would bring it to the altar. To the altar. You, the priest would have you lay your hands upon the head of the animal and symbolically transfer your sins. And then the animal would be killed. And the priest would then take the blood of the animal and sprinkle it on here. I think you might, just because of our talking about the Passover and everything, see already this lamb without blemish and the blood of the lamb, um, deep, important, powerful symbols of, of Christ. The, this is kind of neat that the altar had on it these four horns. Horns were an ancient symbol of, of power. And one of Jesus' names in scripture is the horn of our salvation. And there was a practice in, in ancient Israel that if somebody committed uh, a crime, a, a, a serious crime accidentally, they would flee to the temple and they would grasp onto the horns until a judgment call could be made on, yes, it was accidental. And there's just a powerful symbolism there of holding on to him and grasping onto his mercy and to his atoning grace. And so yeah, everything- and a place that, of safety and a refuge. And we love that- even clear back in Old Testament times, the temple was known or the tabernacle as a place of refuge and still true today that the temple becomes for us this place of refuge, this place of seeking grace, of finding Jesus, of just, we love the thought of that refuge that we find there. Yeah, our friend, Brother Perry, just told us a story of a friend of his who he knew who, um, he showed up to the temple one day just wearing casual clothes and his tennis shoes and everything and wasn't all dressed up and nice and everything. And um, he found out that he had just lost someone really, really dear to him. And the very first thing he thought to do was to run to the temple as a place of, of peace and, and refuge. And that is such a sweet thought that yeah. this could have been that forever. So most of the activity that would happen in the temple would happen right here. The majority of... You know, if you want to add up numbers of things happening, this is where most of the, the action in the temple was, was taking place. Okay, now we'll, um, we'll take you up a little further. Okay, this is called the laver. And to give you perspective, that's the gate and the altar. And then right before you would enter into the, the more second, holy place, yep, the right? second bell. In here, um, this is a laver. Um, we don't have any dimensions in the Bible for the size of it. Um, most Bible scholars assume that it was kind of smaller for this, for Moses' tabernacle. But this was the spot that was used for the washing and the anointing and the clothing and sacred vestments for the priests of Aaron. So this is the part where um, it's going to be so familiar to you when they stood at the door of the tabernacle 
and right of the congregation right Exodus, here um that part where it talks about and they were washed with water and anointed and um received that their clothing that they were going to wear this is a little bit what that is talking about this would be where the oil was would be in something that looked similar to this and again a, a horn right symbolic of that power of jesus christ and then water of course which was symbolic and you also can find in scripture where the water of the labor was also compared to the blood of christ in the book of revelation where john says we were washed by the blood of the lamb so a symbolism that we're familiar with in the sacrament was also a symbolism of another cleansing another washing um another clothing and anointing that was such a royal act is what yeah. you did for kings and queens you and know? you love kind of watching this process that you come in that first gate and and you go through um that process of making sure you are worthy to enter in the next thing that is going to happen is this process of giving up sin right of um understanding sacrifice and atonement is going to happen here now we're coming to a place where we're going to talk about sanctification or purification um, that being made holy, um, you're going to watch it happen in gradients or in degrees as you walk towards each of these different places. And, and we love the thought of just seeing that as you're walking in. So then we're going to come to the second veil. Um, and who could walk in through the second veil were priests and the high priests could right. walk in through the second veil. I, we wish you were here because at this one they actually have incense burning and i don't know why that is so awesome but <laughs> as you walk in there you just can imagine what it would have felt like a little bit maybe what it would have smelled like um if you had been there so just the thought of and neat that god introduces symbols of things that we smell things that we see things that we touch things that we wear to kind of yeah. make it a full experience yeah really awesome so now we're going to take you in i'll just open Okay, we're going to now come in to this place. So this is the inside, the first inside room of the actual tabernacle. And as we come in through here, we want you to be remembering um, those gradients of holiness or degrees of holiness. So outside of the first bell would be what is called in the Bible profane or the common, the common place. Then as you come in that first spot where we just were, that's a holy place. This is going to be a more holy place where we are. And maybe we can just turn and we'll talk a little bit about what's in here. But this is going to be a more holy place. And then... And if we go through into that room, it will be the holiest of all holinesses is what happens when you go in there. Who could come in here were the priests? We talked about that. Who could go in there was the high priest. And he only went in once a year on what is called Yom Kippur. Did I say it right? Because we just got trained how to say it right. Yom Kippur. Um, so in this room, Which is the Day of Atonement. That's the one. That we'll talk about a little later in the video. When we go in there. So in this room, you're going to see the table of shoe bread or showbread. Um, there's going to be this light that has the seven candles or the seven um, lights that are on all branches. of the yeah. seven branches. And then you're going to have this place where incense burns all the time that is going to represent prayers going to heaven. So again, you want to be looking for Jesus everywhere. And we know he tells us, He's the bread of life. Um, I am the light and the life. That's awesome. I am the light and the light yeah, that's cool. of the world as you walk through this part. And, and then let's say this about the the candlestick was actually made. Oh, I just put my hand there. It was actually made to look like an almond tree. It had branches and leaves and buddings on it and, and almonds. And in um, in the land of Israel and everywhere, I guess, um, but almond trees grew there. And the word almond, the noun, the verb in Hebrew is the verb to rise and early. to rise early. To rise early. Yeah. yeah, because the almond tree is the very first tree that blooms after winter. It's the first sign of hope. It's the first sign of spring. It's the first sign of new life and change that's coming. And so this lampstand or tree of life is such a beautiful symbol of Jesus, the first to rise and the sign of our hope and the sign of new change in life. 
Okay, so now we come to this place where the incense is burning all the time. Um, that kind of represents that the prayers of heaven are going up all the time. We love that the four horns are here again. And we love that the last thing you do before you can enter this third or final veil is this prayer that happens. And then we're going to take you into this holy place. And these you'll see there are these cherubim, right? Or guardians of some place holy that you see on the veils. Also, again, teaching that idea of like, make sure you're prepared. You prepare your heart and your mind and your actions for what you're about to participate in as you go in. So this is so fun, you guys, because this would be what the priests wore. And let's just talk about some, the high priest, the high priest wore. Let's just talk about some of what is on here that we love. So I'm going to start at the bottom and we'll go up because David and I love this part. There would have been bells and pomegranates is what would have been at the bottom. And you can hear when he walks, you can just hear all the time in here that tinkling of these bells as he walks. Um, the front would be called the breastplate. Each of those is going to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So everybody represented close to his heart. Um, when you get up on the top where his head is, David, you have to remind me what, if this is where it says holiness, holiness to, to the Lord, Lord yeah, is on the top, which is so awesome. And I love this would have been a, 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 a horn, a call um, that they would do. Then all of these layers have different symbolic meanings and you read about all of them within the Old Testament. But one of my favorite parts is within these layers, and we'll show you in a different place, there is an undergarment or a, a clothing that is worn closest to your skin that would have been worn. Um, they, they would have called the undergarment or they even, it can be translated in Hebrew to say underwear that just reminded them about that being sacred, becoming sacred, that consecration, that thought of um, that holiness with you all the time, which we love the thought about that as we think about all of these things. It would be awesome. Would you mind just walking out there and letting people hear those bells? That is so awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to take you in the Holy of Holies now. Come right in here, and I'm going to actually open this back door uh, so we can get some light in here so you'll be able to see. This would be the Ark of the Covenant. And if you look in here, would you be able to see? This is going to be tricky, but in the Ark of the Covenant, there is um, three things. So you would have the um, Ten Commandments. You have this uh, branch of Aaron, which I love, that is budding. And then you've got this bowl that would have been the manna. We don't know what the manna looked like, but there is a representation here. And then... The Ark of the Covenant, do you want to talk about the mercy seat? Yeah, the Ark of the Covenant was called the the mercy seat or the throne. What was of the, atonement. the throne, the throne of, of atonement? In, in Hebrew, it wouldn't be translated mercy seat. It would be translated as the throne of atonement, which we love the thought of that. Yeah, and this room would have just been the most sacred of all places. Again, only once a year by the high priest after participating in what they called gestures of approach, ordinances that prepared you to enter into more holy spaces. And one of the things we love about this is you're gonna see the gold, how it is described in the scriptures, gold on the outside and on the inside. And we love that the inward and the outward focus were just symbolic of this like beautiful holiness, the, the most sacred place. Just as we stand in here in this Holy of Holies, which is so awesome as you just walk through there and, and you can kind of feel that. It made me think again how important it is, these degrees, and we've talked about this, these degrees of holiness as you enter each of these places or degrees of relationship with the Lord. It's, it's something they believed in in the Old Testament. Something we still believe in today is this degrees of progressing or these degrees of no, holiness as we walk a covenant path and come to know who the Lord is, but also we love these symbols of Jesus. Yeah, just that from the very beginning, the children of Israel were given a visual reminder of who he was and what his heart was like and what his intentions were with his people. 
to move them to more holy spheres, to exalt them, to change them. So anyways, just Hope you love so this filter. Neat. It was yeah. so fun. And we love that as you go through and study, maybe you'll write down some temple or tabernacle symbolism here in your journals. But some of the things that we think are common to all of these places in the tabernacle that we thought you might want to just think about is, first of all, you see Jesus everywhere, right? Sacrifice and purifying and light and bread and an advocate and mercy. Like that is one of the things that you are going to clearly see everywhere. And that will be a type of what is to come. Um, we also love this idea of everything here was constant. The lights were always burning. There was always bread on the table. The incense was always um, rising, right? The, there was a sacrifice in the morning and in the evening of every day. You and know? we love that idea of just constant, that God's presence was constant um, with them there. The third thing we would say is common among all of them. This is the list down at the bottom of the journal. We have Jesus, all symbols of Jesus. Second, they're all constant. Three is just this idea of holiness that we're going to explore a little bit more in just a second. But you would have gone in and known this is a place different and I act differently here and I dress differently here as a way of an, just an outward expression of, of, of what's going on on the inside. And I just, and everything in there reminds you that you're like, oh, I am in a different kind. This is no longer common. This isn't just the wilderness anymore. It's a sacred place within the wilderness. And then number four, which is really neat, is you see um, just the instruction and the teaching of progression through this. And what patterns might enable a person to progress that you begin in this outer court, then can move to a holy place and then eventually into the most holy place. And what, what kind of patterns, you know, kind of lead me along that, that journey as I move through there. Um, there were lots of symbols uh, inside the ancient tabernacle of the Garden of Eden. And remember, Adam and Eve leave the presence of God and go out. And then the tabernacle is built almost as a portable Eden that invites people back into that presence. Like something happened in, on page two of the Bible that, that broke that, that they lost that blessing of God's presence and were cast out. And now it's like a reversal of that. And it's an invitation back in to eventually into the, enjoy the very presence of God again. Yeah, and I just, I love that everything there shows this idea of progression or an exalting process, right? That, and it wasn't just in the way you moved through the tabernacle, but also um, the, what clothing people wore. Moses would wear something and Aaron would wear something and the priests would wear something according to this degree of relationship that they had entered into and, and who could enter which places, right? Moses could always enter here. Aaron sometimes could and the priests in some places and the Levites in some places and the people in some places that everybody was progressing and, and working toward this holier relationship with God. And even the colors would signify that idea of this sacred progression where blue was reserved for the most sacred and purple was just under that. And, and the red would have been just under that. And just this thought of helping us to visually realize that we're continually progressing in relationship with God, that we're becoming, that this exaltation isn't something we just arrive at one day or we wake up at and we're there, but it's going to be this process that we continually go through, which is what Leviticus is going to end up becoming is this process. Um, we love that Exodus shows how Israel was redeemed and are delivered and also set apart as peculiar, but Leviticus will be the provision and the means of how this exalting grace would be accepted and used in a life. Um, at the top of mine, I've written uh, the holiness code. That's yeah. what at the top of my Leviticus says. Yeah, and let's talk about this for a second. You'll notice at the very end of Exodus 40, when the cloud covers the tent of the congregation and the glory fills it, the very next verse 
kind of introduces a problem and says, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And all of a sudden it's just like, oh wait, he's here, but we can't go in there. And you've got this sort of conflict of how do I reconcile just the holiness and the greatness of God and then also like the sinful nature of his people. Like how do we, like we just saw a couple yeah. chapters back, how, that, how easily that can be fractured. And so what, what do we do about that? And the book of Leviticus is sort of that reconciliation. Mm. How do we reconcile? Because I'm, sometimes I think about like holiness, the holiness and glory of God is like the sun. We're like, it's super, super good, but also dangerous if you approach it, like, you know, <laughs> yes. like in, in an inappropriate way yes. or whatever, yeah. you know? And so it's yeah. like, how do we like reconcile all this together? And that's what the book of Leviticus is, is this um, God is holy. How do we experience the same kind of holiness and dwell within that holy presence? Like something needs to happen to, to mediate that, that you yeah, know, for that, that work. for that to happen. And that's what Leviticus will become. It becomes this holiness code, this way of living that is going to allow you to progress in relationship with the Lord. So again, just like we've been talking about for the last two weeks, he is going to set bounds and conditions and expectation of what a covenant relationship with him looks like. And we, we've talked about this but in case you didn't get the last two, where on one hand in the book of Exodus, we watch the children of Israel experience this saving grace, this deliverance or rescue, um, that that grace that heals wounds and helps you to overcome. We, we talk about it a lot as overcoming sin and death. They experience that. They experience the unfailing love of God in that moment of overcoming that place that they were in. Now God is going to invite them into a deeper relationship, a covenant relationship. And he's going to invite them to experience what we would maybe call exalting grace or um, a grace that elevates a soul. That's what they're being invited into, a grace that transforms. This is a grace rather than that helps you overcome. This is a grace that helps you become something. And I love that Leviticus is going to set out for the children of Israel this holiness code or these expectations or conditions that are going to allow them to access this, this other grace. I love how Alfred Adersheim is the one who says it, that he says it's going to be the provisions and the means of how grace would be accepted and used, which is so interesting when you think about grace, because we're really comfortable with saving grace where we just believe and that grace has its effect in us. But then to think about this exalting grace or this grace that elevates a soul, there's going to be a covenant path that allows us to accept and use that grace to become something. Yeah. I love in the Book of Mormon, um, Mosiah is actually talking about this this system, this holiness code, these provisions and means, because mm. the Lord's going to set up some ordinances and rituals that are that are your you participate in to facilitate this. They're all outward expressions of like inner commitments. Mm. And there's this description given in the Book of Mormon, this Mosiah thirteen. 29 and 30, and he says, it was expedient or super needful that there was a law given to the children of Israel, and in their case, a very strict law, for they were stiff-necked and quick to do iniquity, and they danced around cows, and slow to remember the Lord their God. Therefore, there was a law given them, a law of performances and ordinances, a law which they were to observe strictly from day to day to keep them in remembrance of God and their duty towards him. Hmm. And so the opening half, the first half of the book of Leviticus is sort of like a, a, a description and an introduction of, of those performances and ordinances that, what does he say? That are going to help us be able to accept and use this exalting grace, right? This grace that is going to elevate a soul. And I love the thought of that. And when you go through Leviticus, it can feel super overwhelming. It, it is so much almost a checklist of like, 
how to live in relationship <laughs> with God. And we love that as we went through and studied and with our friend Alfred, who we love to tell you about, he breaks this book into two different categories, which we love. The first becomes the manner of access to God and the holiness which comes as a result of that. So this first part is gonna talk about sacrifices, priesthood, worshipers, family life, and congregation life. He, he's gonna teach you what a life with God looks like in all of those places. And, and some of those things, like the suggested reading for the book of Leviticus is gonna be chapters one, 16, and 19. And in one, you're gonna read about those sacrifices. What Chapters one through seven are now all of the sacrifices that are a part of what's called the law of Moses. The law of sacrifice has always been a consistent law, mm. but now in their time, because they needed it, there were now five obligatory sacrifices that they needed to offer. And so it's gonna take you through what a description like. of what that looks like. Eight through 10 will be the priesthood. 11 talks about what the worshipers should look like and how they should act. Uh, Chapter 12 is what family life should look like. And then I love that 13 through 15 is like, let me tell you what a congregation should look like and how a congregation should act. So it's kind of fun to read through them if you know like the theme of what you're about to read to. Should and, we do the and second one you, and then come yeah, back to oh, that? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Do? And if you remember what the purpose of the whole thing was, because if you were to read the whole book, you would get to spots and you were just like, um, there's like an eating code and, and like there's chapters on like these are the things that you you shouldn't eat and here's the things that you should and there's no explanation, <laughs> you know, of why. But like if, if, you know, it's really easy to forget the Lord. We saw that with them, but not if you had to remember him every time you ate because we get hungry every five hours or two if you're a Christian. <laughs> um, and it's and by all, Christian, he means his son. My son. Oh, yeah, my son. <laughs> Or a Christian. Christian people are hungry. Um, but just like there's, it's this whole concept of helping them live in consistent remembrance of God and helping them think about the fact that the holiness of God should be considered in all of the things that I'm doing in my life. Yep. So 1 through 15 is the manner of access to God. That's what's going to happen in that first part. Um, 17 through the end is going to be the holiness that is a result of that. So once you learn how to live within sacrifice, priesthood, how to worship, how to live in family life, how um, a congregation looks, then he's gonna talk about the holiness that is a result of that, um, which helps you to maintain grace and sanctification and this connection with him. And these chapters talk about personal holiness in 17, um, holiness in family, holiness in relationship, holiness in priesthood, and then we love at the end, it talks about holy seasons and then the holy land. And if you're doing the tip-ins with us, um, we love the idea of these holy seasons. And I'm just gonna show these up close. And as you're flipping to that, the Lord introduces these feasts and these festivals for them to remember the stories of redemption, to remember who God is and who they are in relationship to them. So their whole calendar just centers around the redemption story. And you love that um, what happens in the Old Testament time, and if you are Jewish still, is they will have spring feasts, which will be Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. And then they will have fall feasts which is the Feast of the Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, which I hope we're celebrating this year. Have we talked about this? Yes, you built a tabernacle in your backyard okay, yeah. for that very purpose. We are all <laughs> gonna celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles together. It is one of my favorite feasts um, that is one of these, it's laid out in Leviticus. Now, um, for Christians, we look at all of these feasts as something that is representative of the life of Christ. So for us, Passover, when we read about that and we think about that, we remember the death of Jesus. Um, unleavened bread helps us remember his burial. The first fruits help us remember his resurrection. And the Pentecost, with Acts 2, we will um, 
think of or be reminded of the Spirit. And they actually happened on these feasts. Like these events of Jesus' life occurred on these Old Testament feasts that were introduced in the book of Leviticus. He really did die Passover week. He really was buried during the festival of unleavened bread. He really did come back to life and rise again during the festival of the first fruits. And the spirit really did come in its pouring out abundance in during two, the during, feast of yeah, Pe- Pentecost. Pentecost. Um, so that's so fun. And the um, fall feast, the trumpets, the day of atonement and the um, feast of the tabernacles are all representative of the second coming. They're, they're all looking forward Things. So we love the idea of that as we think about these feasts and when we get to um, the Feast of the Tabernacles, which will usually takes place in September or October. I'm going to look up when it is right now so you guys can put it on your calendar because I'm dead set on celebrating that together. And while you're looking that up, just the combination of all of these things together. Again, Paul uses the word schoolmaster in the book of Galatians to talk about it. Now that sounds like a principle with a ruler about to slap your hands or something if you're if you're off but the idea of a schoolmaster was was somebody who was actually it comes from a greek word that means more like um um mary poppins <laughs> like somebody who is supposed to get <laughs> so you fun. isn't that cute someone who's supposed to get you to where you were supposed to go that they had they had people like that in greek culture that like got you to where you were meant to be and that was the purpose of the law right to get them to where god wanted them to be and it was in their celebrations in their daily activities and the things that they ate in the, in their in the temple itself right yeah. yeah in their sacrifices that they would offer all in of their those relationships like with it, others. it just yeah. like infused holiness was meant to infuse their life which makes me think of that quote from Brigham Young that I love so much um we, we'll link to it for sure and that one talk by I think it's Elder Faust but I love when he says, let every m- moment of my life be holiness to the Lord. Mm, mm. And that's what Leviticus is. It's every moment of my life in holiness to the Lord, which I love. Okay, anyone who wants to do the Feast of the Tabernacles with us, it's going to be Sunday, October 9th through Sunday, October 16th. Just put a little don't miss this note on your calendars because we are <laughs> all celebrating that together this year and it is going to be so much fun. There's something really neat that happens if you took take the very ver- first verse of the book of Leviticus. It says, "And the Lord called unto Moses out of the tabernacle." Remember, the Lord is in it and Moses cannot get into it. Then you have this whole book of Leviticus that happens. And when you get to next time, which is the very first verse of Numbers, it says, "And the Lord spoke unto Moses in the tabernacle." And so you see that this book is cleverly written to kind of be this like, oh, this is how we're going to actually enter in. It's actually super cleverly written because you have this section that's like, oh, here's the manner of access to God. One through 15. One through 15. uh, 17 through the end. Here is the holiness that's a result of that. And if you want to be super nerdy, um, they actually line up like this, like sections like this that match up with each other. Like it's constructed super well together. Like the the themes of them go like this. And then there is this middle section right in the middle that describes one of their most holy and and sacred festivals and the description of, of how that operates. And it's the Day of Atonement. This is why chapter 16 is, is I'm guessing, is one of the suggested chapters because it, it describes this, this day that... Um, even though people are apologizing and repenting of their sins, like certainly there must be some things we've forgotten, left undone, and we've corrupted ourselves somehow. And once a year, once a year, there is a, a very particular and special sacrifice that's made with, with two goats. One of them is sacrificed, and the blood is taken all the way into the Holy of Holies, right? And, and it's taken in there, and it is supposed to be this covering this um, sense and idea of this life that was given, right? The, the um, oh, somebody, I wrote this down. Rituals that were, one, a reminder of his grace, but also of his justice and the seriousness of sin and their consequences, both at the same time. Mm-hmm. And it was supposed to be this covering. And then the other goat, a priest would symbolically put the sins of the whole congregation of Israel on it, and they would chase it out and 
to the wilderness. That goat was called the scapegoat. And that's where we get that word mm-hmm. today of this God's efforts of trying to expel the sins of the people, you know, out of the camp. And that chapter and that theme just becomes the center of all of this. It would be really easy to think like, oh, then the way to reconcile my relationship with God is watch what I eat, watch what I say, mm. watch what I do. Yes. You know, what days do I observe and celebrate? Am I doing all the ordinances? Yeah, a checklist. You know, right? And mm-hmm. the book of Leviticus is probably understands that whoever wrote it, that it was like, no, central to all of this, right in the middle. None of this has any efficacy. None of this has any power were it not for the sacrifice of the only begotten and it's just that central Mm. it was his lifeblood that reconciles our relationship he is the high priest who can take us into the holy of holies he is the giving and the exalting on every step of the way through this through this whole thing and makes me think about this um friend of mine who was teaching seminary and was teaching leviticus 1 and if you read leviticus 1 you will read about um, a, a type of sacrifice that was used for forgiveness, a forgiveness of sin sacrifice. And he was explaining it. And what happens in it's described the you, the, the person, the member of the house of Israel would bring a sacrifice to the door of the tabernacle to the priest. And, and then the priest would lay his hands on the animal's head and symbolically transfer your sins to the animal. Then he would hand you the knife and you would have to take the life of the animal yourself. Mm-hmm. This is intense, my friends, <laughs> you know? And it's sort of like, whoa. Anyways, he was teaching this and then he started to move on. And there was a girl in the class who was like, pause. What are you talking about? <laughs> and then he was like, what? And she was like, this is horrible. This is so awful. And then other people in the class kind of started to answer back. And he was like, no, no, the, this was kind of like the custom of the day. Like sacrifice was normal. They were used to that. And, and she was like, no, you don't get used to things like that. What are you, you're just talking about this. Like it's all of you are accepting this. Like it's a normal, okay thing. And they're like, no, no, even, you know, when you ate, you they didn't have grocery stores. Like you had to, you know, kill animals and that's how you ate food. And they're just going through this. And she, and it was like 30 against one. And this girl was not budging. <laughs> she was like, I will not move from this position. And my friend who was teaching said, I just let it go. You know, I just let them kind of go back and forth until finally the girl says, no, no, you don't understand. It's not right. It's not right that that animal should die for something that the person did wrong. That's not right. And then he said, everyone, she's actually the only one in the room who gets it. It's, it's not right that the lamb should die in my place, right? It, that I should bear the punishment of my own sins. And, but but this, is, this, is a, this is a spot where it's teaching no I know it's not right. That's why it's called grace. And that's why it's called mercy that Mm. Jesus comes in and says, I will take the penalty of the broken law. I will reconcile you back to God despite your rebellious nature. And I will turn you into something more, into something golden, Mm. into something... Inside and out. Yeah, inside and, and out. And Alma says this in chapter 34... He says, and behold, this is the whole meaning of the law. Every wit pointing to that great and last sacrifice, that great and last sacrifice will be the son of God, yea, infinite and eternal. Hmm. And um, I, I just think that's a, a really powerful, even though we participate in things that show our inner devotion, that we just always recognize at the center of that is that that sacrifice yeah. in the lifeblood of, of that's Jesus. So good. So yeah, such a good fun book. Yeah, such a good lesson. (laughs) Okay, see y'all next week. Numbers.